of the carbon and other greenhouse gas emissions that are building up in the atmosphere, hence, hence the term carbon majors. Uh, so these, these cases, and I'm about to show you a chart, which is a little hard to read, but you can have it for future reference. Um, you know, these cases are tort cases for the most part. They're, they're not the usual, you know, environmental cases, uh, you know, seeking compliance with regulatory standards, uh, permit requirements and so forth, N nor are they constitutional cases. You know, we, we've, we've got examples of, of those kinds of cases as well with the famous Juliana case, which is still uh, sort of lurching along, I guess I'd characterize uh, right now back before Judge Aiken in, in the Oregon Federal District Court uh, with an argument tomorrow on whether that case should remain viable or be dismissed entirely. But, but we're not talking about constitutional claims either, although there are lots of those uh, in various stages of litigation around the world. We're zeroing in on tort cases and specifically state law-based tort cases. So state common law is the basis for all of these, uh, uh, well, state common law and in some cases state statutes, I should amend to say, uh, which I'll show you on, on this chart. So let's, let's see if we can uh, pull this up and you can take a look. So um, it's a little bit hard to read and you don't have to try to read it word for word, but it gives you kind of a, a sense of the, you know, that sort of the tremendous scope uh, of all the cases that we're talking about. And then I'll circle back to the Baltimore case more specifically. Um, so you can see here that um, these are cases filed by cities, by counties, and by states. We don't yet have any tribal uh, cases, but I can predict that we will be seeing that before too long. Um, and as I mentioned, they're tort cases. So you're, you're going to be familiar with a, a lot of the tort theories uh, that are being brought in these cases. Um, they, the early cases focused a lot on nuisance and particularly public nuisance, but also, as you see there, trespass, negligence, strict liability, uh, defective design of the product. And of course, the products we're talking about here are oil and gas products, you know, the oil we burn in our furnaces or the gas we burn in our cars unless we have electric vehicles. And by the way, I'll put in a plug for Hyundai's uh, Kona, which we just bought. It's a fabulous car, check it out. And lots of great benefits and, and discounts to, to buy one these days, even for struggling law students. Um, so design defect, failure to warn, and then there's a whole category of consumer protection-based cases, which, which you can see here, and those, uh, consumer-based cases are not seeking the same kinds of damages um, that some of the other tort cases, the nuisance and trespass and failure to warn cases are seeking. Um, these, these are based on state consumer laws, uh, which typically are codified in statute. And as you see here, they're being brought by the attorneys general. These are obviously blue state attorneys general. We don't know of any red state, Republican state attorneys general that have brought any of these cases. In fact, the, the Republican attorneys general tend to intervene in, the, in opposition uh, to these cases and in defense uh, of the oil industry or file amicus briefs and so forth. Um, so, you know, this just kind of gives you a sense that, you know, we're talking about um, a return really to basic common law doctrines. And, and if, if you remember torts, uh, you, you remember that that involves a question of duty. You know, what, what duty do, do these companies owe to the public, to their customers, um, their shareholders, and so forth, and then breach uh, of whatever that duty is, uh, and then damages from the breach. So the, the framework of these climate liability cases, you know, although they're dealing with uh, the, the global phenomenon of climate disruption, um, and all of its manifestations, 
the legal framework uh, for the cases is, is the same as it would be in other tort cases, whether you're talking about the tobacco cases, uh, the MBTE cases, which uh, involve the gasoline additive that can, has contaminated a lot of uh, public water supplies. More recently, we're seeing a, a wave of litigation against PFAS and PFOA, the forever chemicals, uh, you know, celebrated in the movie Dark Waters, which some of you have seen, um, and uh, and on and on. The you know uh, Monsanto's Roundup glyphosate has now resulted in four uh, multi-million-dollar uh, judgments. All of these uh, tort cases are based on on that same basic formula: duty, breach, damage. And the same is true of these these climate cases. Although, as we'll see. Um, the climate cases do present a, a, a lot of, uh, of novel questions, uh, not only of law, but of proof and evidence and burden of proof and allocation of responsibility. So the next thing to note in this chart is, you know, where do these cases stand at the moment? And you know, all sort of in the framework of do, do these cases actually have a chance of succeeding? In other words, Will one of these cases actually result in a jury verdict, which would be, you know, measured in the billions, multi-billions uh, of dollars um, or not? Or, or, or will they fizzle out and disappear like so many uh, of the climate cases so far? And so a quick rundown um, is that all of these cases were brought in state court. Uh, and under the federal rules of civil procedure, they can be removed to federal court. Uh, the oil industry has attempted to remove all of these cases uh, to federal court. Uh, so far, um, none of those efforts to remove cases filed in state court to federal court have succeeded. Um, all of the cases uh, were actually remanded back to state court. Um, and um, with one exception, uh, that's the New York City case, um, but that case was actually filed in federal court, so it was not removed from state court. I'll talk a little bit more about the New York City case, uh, time permitting as we go, but stay focused on, on these cases that were filed in state court, removed to federal court, and then remanded back to state court. And um, you can look for yourself on the right hand here uh, for the procedural status of each one of these cases. I, time just doesn't permit to go through every single case. Um, so let's talk about Baltimore and how it affects the progress of, of these cases on this chart. Um, Baltimore, uh, you know, brought its case in, in Maryland District, uh, Maryland uh, State Court. Um, and it was uh, removed to federal court and then remanded back to state court. Then the industry appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, and in the appeals to the Fourth Circuit, the oil companies focused quite a bit uh, on the doctrine of federal officer participation. And their theory was that because oil companies, almost everything they do, in one way or another involves the federal government, either through leasing or contracting or regulation. Um, you know, the federal involvement in oil and gas development is of course pretty extensive. So the, the industry was trying to make the argument that in some cases they were actually acting at the direction, as they put it, of various federal officers. I mean, in one case, for example, the federal government was buying oil and gas and putting it in the National Petroleum Reserve um, for obviously emergency use. And, you know, the, the industry was arguing that kind of federal directive or federal involvement uh, triggers federal jurisdiction. They had seven other possible grounds for federal court jurisdiction in addition to the federal officer uh, involvement. And so when the Fourth Circuit took up the appeal 
uh, of the remand of the Baltimore case back to state court, it focused solely on the federal officer question, not the other seven grounds um, that the industry was arguing. And it's a convoluted argument based on the text of um, federal law, federal civil procedure, which I'm not going to spend any time on because it really doesn't matter at this point. Uh, what the Supreme Court said is the Fourth Circuit was wrong to just focus on that sole ground of federal officer involvement. The Fourth Circuit should have considered every conceivable basis that the industry was arguing uh, for why the court, why the cases belong in federal court, notwithstanding that the cases, the pleadings in the cases, the complaints in the cases, uh, make out solely claims based on state law. There's no reference whatsoever to federal law in the complaints that have been filed in these cases. They're, they're strictly state common law based claims. And the reason for that is twofold. One, the Supreme Court has ruled in another case called AEP, American Electric Power versus Connecticut, that there is no federal common law basis for claims for either injunctive relief or damages against the oil companies. No federal common law basis for those cases. So there have been in several cases brought based on the, uh, on the idea that there was federal common law. They've all been dismissed and no one argues any longer that there's any basis for these cases in federal common law. Second, nor is there any basis in the Clean Air Act for these cases. These are damage cases. These are cases seeking money for the damage that climate change is causing, um, not injunctions. Th these are not cases seeking to enforce any regulatory requirements of federal law at all. Um, so the Supreme Court didn't reach any of those uh, specific questions in the Baltimore case. It didn't reach the merits. Justice Gorsuch wrote the opinion. His very first uh, paragraph in the opinion said flat out, this case has nothing to do with the merits of the claims that have been brought, which of course was a big sigh of relief uh, to the plaintiffs in these cases, because there was some concern that the Supreme Court, even if it didn't explicitly rule, which was unlikely on the merits of the cases, it might say something fairly negative about these cases, but it didn't. It, it stayed completely away uh, from the merits of the cases. Uh, so the upshot of the Baltimore case is that not only was the, the Baltimore case sent back to the Fourth Circuit uh, to consider these other possible grounds for first uh, federal jurisdiction, but several of the other cases that are on this chart were also sent back, including the Boulder case. Uh, the city and county of Boulder have brought actions against the oil companies. Um, for, among other things, the drought and the, the interference with uh, water supply and snowpack and so forth that's occurring in the West. Um, the same thing for Rhode Island. That case was sent back um, to the uh, First Circuit um, uh, for further proceedings. Um, and the Ninth Circuit cases uh, uh, involving uh, San Francisco and Oakland San Ma and Ma San Mateo. So uh, four different circuits uh, had cases pending, appeals pending on this question of federal jurisdiction. And as a result of the Baltimore case, it's clear now that we're going to see another period of time pass while each of these circuit courts deals with these remands. Um, and there may be you know, further uh, appeals of some of these other cases as we go forward. Uh, and the rule now is going to be whatever the, whatever bases the oil companies are arguing for federal court jurisdiction, those have to be adjudicated through the appeals process um, in the federal courts. Uh, my prediction on this is that these are not stoppers. Uh, I've looked at every single opinion that's been written in these cases, and with one exception, they have all rejected every one of the grounds for which, uh, on which the uh, oil companies are claiming federal court jurisdiction. Um, if there's questions about that, you can ask me at the end. But 
Uh, my read of the cases so far and in the law sort of in general uh, is that there is no basis in federal court uh, for these cases to be removed from state court. And, and therefore, after this period of time, while we sort out, you know, some of these jurisdictional arguments, uh, my prediction is these cases are going to wind up back in state court. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that even though the cases are being litigated in state court, that doesn't prevent the oil companies from making arguments like federal law does preempt some of these state common law cases. And one of the arguments uh, that the oil companies is making is that the Clean Air Act preempts any of these state common law cases. The problem they're going to face in that argument is that the Clean Air Act, like the Clean Water Act, contains an, a specific savings provision, uh, which was specifically designed to preserve state common law claims against entities regulated under the Clean Air Act. And, and we have quite a bit of, of precedent uh, for that point. What we haven't seen, of course, is a case quite like this, which is against the producers of the products, not the power plants that are emitting or the other industrial sources that are emitting uh, the greenhouse gases. So there, there is an interesting legal question of does the Clean Air Act apply at all um, in these cases? The industry, of course, is going to argue, and it's true, that the basis for the state claims for damages is based on the emissions. It's not based on the process of extracting and transporting uh, the oil and gas. It's based on an end use consumption of oil and gas and the emissions that result from that. So that's one of the novel questions presented in this these cases. And that is, how should the Clean Air Act be interpreted in the context of these cases? And more specifically, how should the savings provision be interpreted? It, you know, it has, if the Clean Air Act applies, then the savings provision does apply and it must save something. It can't be a dead letter. It can't be a null set. Um, and so we'll have to wait for further developments on that front, but just, you know, put a pin in that preemption question because it, it's clearly one that ultimately is going to have to be resolved by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the, the question there is when. Um, the industry was actually hoping that the Supreme Court in the Baltimore case might say something about that and might even go even further and sort of cut through everything and just say, you know, rule by fiat almost, oh, all of these cases are preempted. But it didn't do that. It was very careful not to do that. So now we're going to have to wait and see you know, how the industry seeks to inject this federal preemption argument into the case and whether it can get that argument back in front of the Supreme Court before one of these cases actually gets to a jury, gets to trial. So that's something to, uh, to keep an eye on. So that's enough for now on sort of the procedural status. Again, people can ask questions before we're done on any of that. It, it, it is convoluted and it's multi-layered. So if there's a little bit of uncertainty and confusion, that's not your fault. Um, let's go to the broader question for a moment. Um, what kinds of damages are these cases seeking? What are they alleging? And what are they gonna have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence before a state court jury. These are all jury cases uh, so far. Uh, maybe some of the consumer protection cases might be bench trials, but let's stick with jury trials for the moment since that's the, that, that's the big game. That, that's the major focus of these cases. Um, and so the first uh, uh, point is what kinds of damages? And um, the early cases, the, Calif were the California were the earliest cases, and those were almost all based on a combination of sea level rise, coastal erosion, 
and uh, saltwater intrusion. Um, they didn't actually, at the time the cases were filed, um, bring in the wildfire, the catastrophic wildfire damages uh, that are occurring. It would not surprise me to see those come into these cases um, at some point. Same thing with the Boulder case. It was primarily about water supply um, and the interruption of sort of the regular pattern of both precipitation and runoff and the need to build bigger reservoirs to capture more of the runoff and so forth. Um, in some cases, Baltimore being one, flooding uh, with intense downfall, uh, downpours and, and rainfall that's creating these enormous sinkholes. If you go online and, and Google uh, Baltimore sinkhole, you'll see exactly uh, what I'm talking about. I'm sure it'll be an exhibit in the case. An, an entire roadway in Baltimore collapsed with all the cars that were on it falling into a 30-foot hole in the ground uh, and so forth. Um, and we know that sea level rise and the associated impacts uh, of flooding um, is being exacerbated by climate change. You know, flooding happens without climate change. Sea level rise to some extent, not much, uh, happens without it. Drought happens, of course. Wildfires happen, of course. But but as you, you must know by now, uh, what what human caused climate global warming is doing is it's exacerbating, amplifying all of those effects. Um, it's weather on steroids is the way the, the climate scientists uh, explain it. So one piece of these cases is going to lay the scientific foundation for the damage that the uh, cities and states are claiming is actually uh, either the result of climate change, global warming, or is made much worse. And this introduces the whole concept of attribution science. And there are two ways to think about the question of attribution. One is how much of the damage that we see from sea level rise, drought, wildfire, so forth, uh, attributable uh, to temperature increases, global uh, temperature increases, and, and the related effects of those temperature increases, like increased precipitation in the atmosphere and so forth. Um, so that's one question. How much of the damage you see in these extreme events can you attribute to climate change? And then the second question, and the most important question for these cases, is how much of that damage that's being caused by climate change be attributed to these individual defendants, these individual oil companies? So that, that's called attribution. Uh, you might also think of it as allocation of responsibility uh, for a tort. This is a mass tort kind of context we're talking about. Um, and you have to figure out how to allocate responsibility when you have an indivisible problem, uh, which uh, climate change is because all of these gases, greenhouse gases, mix very well in the atmosphere. So these are indivisible harms in the context of tort law, which means that parties that are found liable are jointly uh, and severally liable for the damage. Um, and that means that any one of them um, can be tabbed, tagged with the entire cost of the damage being caused. If you think about Superfund and the cleanup of hazardous waste sites, you know that's the most outstanding example we have uh, in environmental law of joint and several liability. Uh, and so that concept is uh, embedded in these climate cases. Um, so keep that in mind. So one, one question is going to be, um, you know, what is the, uh, uh, what can science tell us about the percentage of damage that's occurring from these events that we're witnessing uh, that can be attributed to, to climate change? An example of this, by the way, uh, uh, would be Hurricane Harvey. Uh, which hit Houston and the, and the Texas Gulf Coast in 2017, uh, post-mortem and then dumped 50 inches of rain uh, on Houston in two days. 
post-mortem analyses of that event said that at least 40% of the damage caused by Harvey would not have been caused but for global warming, climate change. So that's an example of what I mean by attributing some percentage of the damage from these individual events or effects to climate change. When it comes to uh, attributing uh, responsibility to individual companies uh, for this damage, um, th there's another body of science uh, that was pioneered by a man named Richard Heedy, Heedy, H-E-E-D-E, and now many others. And these scientists have done very sophisticated modeling and calculations that can actually tease out how much of the emissions that are in the atmosphere are actually attributable to individual oil companies. So that will be another major piece of expert testimony. And of course, if you know, if you think about evidence law, uh, you know that uh, in a jury case, the judge is the gatekeeper uh, for the evidence that the jury is, is allowed to consider. And the judge will have to determine what, you know, of, of the scientific evidence that'll be adduced in these cases, which is very cutting edge science, you know, how much of that is going to get to the jury. And, you know, in a, a, a voir dire of, of individual experts uh, under the Dobert uh, doctrine uh, is going to be at the center, I would predict, of these cases as they move closer to trial. But, um, you know, the, pl the plaintiff's lawyers are, of course, w well aware of all of these challenges and are working day and night uh, in, in preparation for, for bringing this kind of evidence into court and getting it to the jury and then getting the kind of jury instructions um, that allows the jury to apply this complex scientific evidence uh, to the claims that are, that are made in the cases. So let, let me now throw one other kind of central, uh, I think, concept in these cases into the mix. And that is, uh, which of these various theories, uh, tort theories, offers uh, the best prospect for success? And I don't think it's nuisance. Um, I, I think nuisance law, um, you know, it's not only complicated, it's very uncertain. I mean, nuisance law has been used in these other tort cases. It's been used in tobacco. It was used against the paint companies uh, for lead paint contamination of residential dwellings. Um, it's been used in um, the PFOA cases and others. Um, so it, it's not like the nuisance claims don't have some legs. They do. Um, but I think... Um, the, the claims that have the best chance are the ones that are based on failure to warn. Um, and, you know, these really are garden variety or plain vanilla tort claims. Um, what the states and cities and counties are alleging, which we've read about now for years, is that these companies knew, uh, going all the way back to the 1970s, that uh, their products... We're, we're creating emissions um, that were changing the climate of the earth and warming the globe. Um, it's been documented over and over again uh, in internal corporate documents that the company's own assessments, their own scientists, their own technicians were warning the companies for decades that global warming was real, climate change was real, it was gonna get worse, it was going to create serious harm. The companies needed to take account of that. And instead of taking account of it and admitting it and disclosing it in securities filings, in promotional materials, in advertisements, in, instead of acknowledging what they knew, they covered it up. They lied. It, this is a basic, simple in, in, in concept uh, argument that the tort here the wrong here is the lying, the deceit. And had they not, and here's, here's the key for what the plaintiffs are going to have to prove in court uh, to win. They not only have to prove the companies lied, I don't think they're going to have any trouble proving that. 
but they have to prove that the lie caused or contributed to the damage that they're claiming. They have to be able to show that had the companies fessed up, had they been more honest, more transparent, more candid about what they knew, and also had they taken action um, to address the dangers that they knew were being created, and certainly not taken actions to oppose government efforts to address climate change. For example, the Waxman-Markey bill, which died in the Senate in President Obama's first term, the industry organizations were solidly against that legislation and are credited with killing it. So that's the link that the plaintiffs in these cases are going to have to make. Not just that the companies lied, people do lie, companies do lie, um, but what was the result of the lie? And can they, can they make a, a, a strong enough argument to get past a motion to dismiss or a directed verdict and get the case to the jury uh, on the basis that, but for the lies, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. We wouldn't be facing the damages that we're having to deal with. We wouldn't be facing the challenge of building seawalls and beach renourishment and bigger reservoirs and moving people out of has high hazard areas and floodplains, all of which, by the way, we're facing. Um, and, and so on. So that, to me, is the real essence um, of, of these climate cases. If they, if they can get a, a court and a jury to accept that the conduct of the defendants was tortious and, and is at least a significant contributor to the damage that's being alleged, um, they have a chance of winning a verdict. So how would the damages be calculated? That's another tricky part of these cases. Um, in the first instance, um, states and counties and cities are, are shelling out money left and right, dealing with all the effects of climate change, sea level rise, saltwater intrusion, loss of precipitation, uh, heat waves that are hitting major urban areas, uh, causing heat stroke, uh, and on and on. So they're going to have to then get economic testimony that calculates how much money uh, not only is, is already being spent to deal with these effects, but going forward, how much money can be anticipated um, that will be required to adapt to the extent possible uh, to what's coming. We've just seen another UN, or it's actually an IPCC report that's, that's even more discouraging and, and scary than all the others. It's still in draft form, but it'll be out um, by early next year. Uh, so the, these impacts are, 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 are bad. Uh, they're going to get a lot worse, and they're going to cost a lot of money. We know that extreme weather events are already resulting in multi-billion dollar loss and damage, particularly in the United States, because we have such high value real estate. Um, but all over the world. So that's another piece of these cases is how should the damages be calculated? How should they be apportioned among the defendants? And on apportionment, uh, the theory is going to be market share. That was the same theory that's been used in all of these other tort cases, tobacco, lead paint, uh, you know, uh, glyphosate, uh, PFOA, all of these cases come down to individual defendants share of the market, what, what percentage of the oil and gas is Shell and BP and Exxon and so forth responsible for. And as I say, the emissions that result uh, from the production and, and, and promotion of those products, all, all of that gets thrown into the mixer uh, in these cases and outspits numbers, uh, which will have to be vetted and tested in court. And then finally, the jury will be charged with coming up with a figure uh, to award uh, by way of damages. And as I said, e even if these cases get all the way to a verdict, this, this overarching question of preemption will remain. Um, and I'm almost positive that, that that's got to be resolved uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, the arguments in favor of preemption 
um, are you know pretty straightforward. The industry is saying uh, not just preemption, but but frankly a, a defense to liability. Uh, uh, you know, in general, is number one, we're making products that people want. Um, you know, it's, it's ultimately us, the, the consumers, that are responsible. Uh, for these problems, if we wouldn't be, you know, buying all this gasoline and burning it in our cars, uh, we wouldn't be causing these problems. Um, that, that's a little clever, uh, but but that's one of their arguments. Um, another one is this is a global phenomenon, um, and it, you know it, it can only be dealt with in the legislative in the political process. It can only be dealt with by the other branches of government. The courts have no business assigning blame and responsibility, that's not really going to, in the end, solve the problem. And to a certain extent, they're right. Uh, you know, awarding damages doesn't reduce emissions. In fact, the premise of these cases is that emissions are going to continue, and that's the problem, even if they gradually get reduced or even if they are dramatically uh, reduced, there's still going to be residual damage. Uh, that's the theory of these cases. Um, so these cases are not about solving the climate price, uh, problem at all. Uh, th they're about uh, compensating the victims of, of uh, if you will, uh, uh, or th those that are affected by climate change. Um, and then finally, you know, the the companies are, are going to appeal to the Supreme Court and say, e even if the Clean Air Act itself can't be read to preempt all these cases, the, the court should adopt uh, uh, the doctrine of absolute preemption. Um, this is a this is mostly a, a conceptual doctrine. It's it's only been applied in a couple of cases that have little to do with environmental law or climate change, um, and and it's usually where Congress has taken an action that the Supreme Court has deemed to be completely occupying some field, and that's really not the case with the Clean Air Act or any other env environmental law for that matter. So. Um, but the, the industry is intent on trying to convince the Supreme Court it should fashion sort of a new rule of jurisprudence, which is there are some problems, some issues for which the resolution does not lie in court, any court, not just in, not in the federal courts, but not in the state courts either. And, and that only the Congress and uh, the president, the executive branch, um, can deal uh, effectively with a global problem like climate change. So at some point, um, I, I expect to see in the U.S. Supreme Court um, those kinds of arguments being laid before the court. And as I say, we'll have to wait and see how that works out. So with a couple minutes to go before I stop, let me bring the shell case into the mix here a little bit, because it is uh, an important development. Um, some of you probably have heard about, read about, studied the Urgenda case, which is uh, the Dutch Supreme Court decision, um, which is so far the, the most significant judicial decision uh, on the question of climate mitigation in the world. Uh, and the Dutch Supreme Court actually ordered the Dutch government to immediately reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 25 percent by 2020, and the Dutch government uh, complied and adopted a whole bunch of policies and shut down some coal plants. and And rather than fight the the decision of the Supreme Court, um, it it decided to to accept it uh, and and actually enact uh, policies and 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 actions to to achieve it. Um, and the Urgenda case was based on primarily. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights and two, two provisions of that convention. Uh, but it was also based on Dutch tort law, Dutch constitutional law. Um, and clearly, the Dutch courts are, are more open uh, to judicial intervention uh, in cases uh, where the courts are convinced um, that that intervention is justified uh, with, re with, with due regard for separation of powers. Uh, you know, the agenda decision goes in great detail in explaining why climate change presents um, the kind of existential threat um, that requires judicial intervention, particularly where constitutional human rights uh, are involved. Uh, so that's the background to the Shell decision, is, is the uh, Dutch Supreme Court decision in her agenda. And then uh, the same uh, uh, 
organizations that brought the Urgenda case followed up by suing Shell, uh, Royal Dutch Shell, um, again, um, under constitutional and human rights uh, arguments. Um, and in this case, uh, it's, it's the, the district court in The Hague uh, of the Netherlands that issued uh, this really remarkable decision within the last month, um, uh, ordering Shell uh, to reduce its emissions by 45% based on 2019 levels uh, by 2030. Uh, obviously, a very rapid uh, drawdown of emissions. Um, the most amazing thing about the court's decision is that it wasn't just talking about the emissions from Shell's own operations. It was talking about what we call scope three or scope two and three emissions, which means Shell's entire supply chain for delivering oil and gas to customers and end use by the customers themselves. Those are so-called scope three emissions. Now, if you read the decision carefully, you'll see the court distinguish between the duty to immediately reduce those emissions that Shell actually controls. That was a hard 45% reduction by 2030, no excuses kind of ruling. When it came to the uh, consumer uh, uh, uses, the scope three emissions, the court said that Shell must use um, uh, something like all practical measures um, to reduce those emissions. Because you see those you know, obviously involve the individual actions of millions of people um, and intermediaries. So, so those are the most difficult, obviously, to, to get a handle on. And the court recognized that. Um, the interesting thing is, you know, this is the first time a court has ever ordered a private company uh, to take action like this. Um, the court did leave it open to Shell uh, to decide how to do it. It mentioned things like offsets through planting trees, uh, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, promotion of alternative uh, means of um, uh, meeting demand for these fuels through like hydrogen. Um, Shell has actually invested quite a bit in hydrogen technologies. It, it is beginning to invest in renewables uh, as a percentage of its you know, forward-looking uh, business plan. Uh, so um, the Shell decision is one to take note of. Uh, certainly the financial markets around the world are taking note of it. Other companies are certainly taking note of it, uh, but it will be appealed uh, to the Court of Appeals in, in the Netherlands, and that will then uh, probably go to the Dutch Supreme Court, and that will take, no doubt, several years. It took several years for the agenda decision to finally get resolved. But it's one to look at and it's part of this larger point that I'll close on, which is that so much is happening right now in the energy space, uh, not just energy, transportation and others as well, um, that it's clear that things are changing, that we've reached some kind of inflection point um, in the world on energy policy um, and climate change and investments in new technologies. Um, it's not fast enough. It's not at the scale needed, but things are happening. And these decisions that are emphasizing the risk, this is in this case, the financial risk of continued reliance on fossil fuels, that understanding is penetrating the markets. The major banks, the brokerage firms like BlackRock, um, th these are all indications that things are changing. And, and I'll close by saying they need to change a lot faster uh, and at a much larger scale. And now I'll stop and, um, and take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Professor Parento. Um, intimidatingly knowledgeable as always. Don't spit out your <laughs> um, so to our audience, um, we do have time for some questions. And as a reminder, if you're watching on the live stream, 
you can click on the icon at the bottom of the video and that'll bring up the chat box where you can log in and add your question. Or if you're watching on Facebook, add your question to the comment box below and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. Um, first question is, you talked about how um, climate change is of a scope that really isn't within the, the judicial branch's jurisdiction. It's really a problem for the legislature. Um, and yet, you know, the, the reason that we, we haven't really been able to see any action is it seems like it keeps getting bounced around between different branches of government. And, and so what's a person to do if the legislative branch won't do anything um, and they're looking for remedies in the judicial branch? Um, so what, what's your reflection on that? You know, you said, you said that the legislature is best, but they're not doing it. Yeah. I mean, I agree with that. And I, I think that le the judicial branch failed in the Juliana case by not recognizing that even though ultimate solutions reside in Congress, um, there were still constitutional issues that deserved to be answered. For example, you know, do we as Americans have a right to, as Judge Aiken put it, a climate system capable of sustaining human life. That strikes me as a rather important question to answer. Uh, if, if our constitution does not guarantee, you know, in colloquial terms, a, a livable planet, uh, then uh, my goodness, um, wh where does that leave us? I mean, the constitution protects lots of rights that aren't written into the constitution. And the Supreme Court has found many rights which we highly value, um, not in the language or text of the Constitution, but in sort of um, an understanding that, that what, what rights people really should have. Um, so th the idea that um, we need Congress and the executive branch to do more, adopt more laws and policies, fund more infrastructure development and so forth, you know, that to me, that doesn't change the responsibility of the courts to answer questions about constitutional law or, in this case, common law. I mean, that, that's in, in these tort cases, we're talking about judge made law. That's that's what tort law is. And it fills gaps uh, when when there, when the legislation itself doesn't provide a remedy for damage that's occurring from people that are responsible for the damage, then that's the precise point at which the court should step in and, and provide the process um, by testing the evidence um, and determining rights and responsibilities um, and compensating people that deserve compensation. And it, it has to be done in a fair way, in a due process way, but it, it, you know, the fact that this is a big problem uh, shouldn't change, to my way of thinking, the responsibility of the courts to deal with it. Um, in fact, if anything, uh, the, the fact that it is a big problem um, it, it demands even more scrutiny by the courts and involvement by the courts, with due respect for the limits of what courts can do. Uh, you know, the courts have lots of tools. They have injunctions, declaratory judgments penalties, mediation, uh, all, all kinds of uh, possible remedies. Uh, they don't have to take over, you know, the United States government, which is what some people claim they're doing. Um, but they can certainly articulate duties and responsibilities that aren't being met, that are creating an existential threat to the well-being of citizens. That's what we're talking about. Um, you mentioned the Juliana case, you know, the, that was a case that was filed in 2015 when Obama was president. Um, you know, we, one of the reasons why advocates like our children's trust and the, and the youth in that case have gone to the judicial branch is that of the three, it seems like the one that's supposed to be the most apolitical. Um, and so often it, we hope it will be a reprieve from some of the, uh, partisan politics around issues like climate change. Um, but the um, federal government 
really fought, some would say, kind of dirty in that case in their uh, procedural attempts to avoid having to say anything substantive in the case, you know, um, you know, applying for cert on every little procedural stay. Um, do you anticipate any changes in that type of approach to litigation on these cases under President Biden? I was hoping that President Biden and the new Department of Justice leadership would heed Judge Aiken's plea most recently when she sent the parties to mediation before magistrate judge who's retired now, Coffin. Um, I was hoping that somewhere within the Biden administration, somewhere within the White House, someone would say, this is an opportunity for us to show good faith and recognize that what these youth plaintiffs uh, are claiming is true, that the federal government is not only failing to act, but it's deliberately taking actions that are making the situation worse. And that's unfortunately even true of Biden. Biden's doing a lot of really good things, talking about doing a lot of really good things, but he's, he's, he's also, you know, part of a system that is continuing to develop new sources of oil and gas. He just declined to, uh, 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 you know, review and cancel leases in the Arctic National Petroleum Reserve. He, he is agreeing to review and potentially cancel leases that were issued in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. But that, that little vignette kind of shows you the balance that even Biden feels he has to strike in these instances where he can't take the position that there will be no further oil and gas development. I mean, there are legal reasons why in some respects he can't do that. Um, so, you know, but back to your question, Jenny, it doesn't look like the Biden administration is going to take advantage or the opportunity uh, to reach some kind of an agreement in the Juliana case that, that would solidify some of the commitments uh, he's made in the executive orders, for example, that, that he's issued. He has to do it carefully. He, you know, he, he's got to be careful not to set himself up to be sued. Of course, he's being sued every day um, by committing to take actions before he's complied with the procedures of the Administrative Procedure Act, for example, and other, other legal requirements. So he, it, it is a tricky thing for Biden to settle a case and commit to doing certain things, but, but a refusal to do anything in that direction would be a missed opportunity in my mind and, and, and an unfortunate signal to send to these youth plaintiffs who were looking, you know, justly for, for some sign that we're on the way to addressing these problems in a more meaningful way. Thank you. I like that caveat on Biden's doing lots of good things, asterisk, talking about doing lots of good things. I, I recommend that as a, a revised title for your talk today. Yeah. All the branches are, tr are talking about trying to do good things. Okay. Yes. Um, well, we are we are out of time. That was that was super interesting as always. Thank you, Professor Parento, and thanks to everybody who joined us today. Our next talk will take place here on June 29th at noon Eastern time, and we hope to see you then. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.